Um, so, uh, agenda item nine, uh, we're back on the European Union withdrawal bill. Um, we'll continue our evidence session on that. And uh, can I welcome Professor Stephen Tierney, Professor of Constitutional Theory at the University of Edinburgh. Um, Professor Tierney, we've had a couple of sessions on this uh, earlier on, uh, and we'll go through more or less the same questions because you may well have a different take uh, on the previous witnesses. So I'll, I'll ask the first one. Um, the bill confers wide powers on UK and devolved ministers to correct retained EU law. Is the broad scope of those powers appropriate and necessary? <clears throat> it's a difficult question. I mean, I think we, we do need to preface the, the discussion, as you see, by, the, by just outlining how extensive the powers are. And there's the powers set out in clauses seven to nine of the bill are extremely extensive. Uh, they give powers to ministers to uh, use delegated powers to correct um, deficiencies uh, in retained EU law, which is a very broad category itself. But they also contain broad Henry VIII powers, um, which allow this to be done by the correction of primary legislation. Mm. In terms of appropriateness and necessity, the UK government does justify this in the Delegated Powers Memorandum, which comes with the bill, and they put forward three reasons as to why these powers are, are necessary. The first one is that the government estimates there are 12,000, over 12,000 EU regulations and over 6,000 EU directives in force across the EU. So the first reason is that simply to address this by exit day, the, the government requires latitude. Um, secondly, as a matter of practicality, it's simply not necessary to make all of these changes on the face of the bill. So the, the bill itself couldn't possibly uh, either remove or transpose all of these. It's going to have to be done after the bill. The third is flexibility. We are, we, the, we're in the middle of Brexit negotiations at this precise moment. Uh, there's also going to have to be a discussion between the UK government and the devolved administrations about how those powers that might be devolved are, are, are treated. So for all of these reasons, the third justification for these powers is, is flexibility. Mm. This is, I think, a very plausible argument. I think the, the UK government, as a generality in this situation, can plausibly make this argument. If you're going to have Brexit, one might think Brexit's a terrible idea, but if Brexit's going to happen, these regulations and directives have to be dealt with. And it seems that this is a, a, a way to do it. I would also mention two other caveats. Um, there are limitations on the use of the powers, which we can come back to within the within the, the Act. So they're not unlimited powers. And secondly, they carry sunset clauses. So they can only be used for a certain period of time. Mm. Um, so... I think they're excessively broad, and as we drill down into some of the detail, we'll, we'll see that they're, they're excessively broad. And in, in just about any other statute, they would look ast astonishing. But given the context here, it's hard to see another way to do this, uh, but the powers, I think, could be more tightly constrained than they are. OK. Um, so in what way could they be more tightly constrained? I think one of the real difficulties is the fact that the powers are themselves contingent upon the most significant provision within the bill. And the most significant provision within the bill is the bill that retains EU law. Uh, that term itself is very, very broad. And capacious. What, what is meant by retained EU law, which is set out in the early clauses of the bill, is very, very broad. Uh, and I don't, you know, the, we you, we don't have to concern ourselves with with a lot of the ambiguities in that term. But what I'm alluding to is the fact that the regulation powers relate to a term. So very broad powers relate to a term which is itself unclear. And when a term is itself unclear, that invites the powers to be used in a very broad way. So that's the first 
difficulty. Um, Clause 7 itself allows the regulations to be made to prevent, remedy or mitigate any failure of retained op EU law to operate effectively or any other deficiency in maintained EU law. So terms like operate effectively or deficiency are pretty broad. So you know, if you, if you give a minister a power to correct any deficiency and, and effectively make it a subjective test mm. for the minister to determine what operating effectively means, what a deficiency means, then you're giving a very broad power. Um, so on that basis, I think they, they operate very broadly. There could possibly have been more limitations built into, the, you know, the, the limitations that are there under clause seven, six are very narrow. And I think one of the other issues that we'll come on to presumably will be the scrutiny, you know, to what extent, um, if you're gonna give these very broad powers, to what extent are you giving power the, to Parliament or to parliaments uh, to to really get time to look at how these powers are being used, and it, it looks as though that's that's not going to be the case. Mm. I mean, you, you, you mentioned ambiguities, and we discussed this um, earlier. Um, some of the kind of vagueness of language um, is that something you think should be tightened up? It's. <sighs> My view of the my view of the bill is a might seem a little bit paradoxical. I, I look at it and I at least look at these powers and they're very very broad and they raise real constitutional concerns. <laughs> but then when you ask yourself the other question, how would you go about it in a different way? It's actually very very difficult mm. to come up with a concrete alternative, which would be constitutionally better, but which would make this manageable. Because we are talking about a very short period of time uh, and a massive body of law that is going to have to be dealt with. And not just that, but it's a movable feast. You know, as the UK negotiates with the EU, we don't know what kind of shape proto-agreements are going to be taking mm. as the UK moves towards exit day. And so the UK, for example, can't plan to get rid of a whole swathe of law which might actually become part of a trade deal, you know, might be within the, the 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 remit of a future trade deal, which it would make more sense to to retain, or there might even be commitments to to uh, to maintain EU law. I mean, there's there's talk now of a, trans, a fairly lengthy transitional period where it might be that these powers will will not be used at all. So, so it's very difficult to see how the the the, the skeleton of the of the bill could be very different from what it is. Has your view of the bill changed? It's my view of the bill hasn't changed. I think there are ways in which it can be tightened up, but I think it's very difficult to see how, in fundamentally, it could, it could be it could be done in a, in a totally different way. Yeah. So when you first looked at it, you thought, "Whoa!" It's, it's not so much my view of the bill's changed. I think. It's one looks at the bill and thinks this is a deeply constitutionally problematic. Right. The the government is taking to itself very broad powers to change the law through delegated powers, most often through negative procedure. Um, often Henry the Eighth power, so to change the law with negative procedure. All of this in any other bill, it's simply that the 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 problem is not so much this bill; it's the project that the bill is having to serve. The bill is having to serve a massive constitutional change that has to happen very quickly. Yeah. So the bill is deeply problematic, but it's it's almost an inevitable consequence of a, of the kind of process for which it's about to serve. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, Professor Tierney. Um, just, you mentioned there uh, in terms of the, the, the transition deal and was. Now, if the the transition deal uh, was to last for say two years, uh, would it then be important or crucial that the uh, that the, the laws are all transposed into UK legislation before the transition deal, or if the transition deal is two years or three years or four years, would that then provide uh, an additional period of time to get these laws then transposed into UK law? There would be two different ways to do it. Um, if the transition deal 
came with a subsequent an, another piece of legislation that in effect continued the effect of EU law. That would be one way to do it, um, to actually go round the provisions of this bill and to treat exit as though it were not in fact exit at, for that period of time. That would presumably be politically problematic for the, the government, the UK government. Um, if that's not the case, an exit day is not only formally exit day, but also the day in which EU law ceases to apply, then this bill would, would carry on as it were, and all of these laws that would be kept would be, would be retained. Um, what would happen in that case? So if this bill carries on as it were, what I think we would see, rather than any new piece of legislation, is simply that the delegated powers wouldn't really need to be used very much, except simply to, to, to you know, uh, block transfer EU law into UK law as a going concern for the transition period. It would also give parliamentarians and the government, the UK government, much longer to then plan for 21 rather than 19 or whenever the, the, the period would end. So the, the sort of rush that we envisage here could be postponed. So there's two ways to do it. One would be effectively not to leave for, for two years. The other would be to leave, but it would be a, almost a symbolic leaving for two years in which the, the obligation would be just to continue to be bound by EU law. Um, government ministers would probably come under the sort of constraints the Scottish institutions come under at the moment of you know not not acting incompatibly with EU law that you would need some kind of provision like that at UK level okay no that's uh, that's helpful just uh, it's when you mentioned the transition deal yeah. um, I yeah. thought I would pose the question sure. uh, also I mean, the bill uh, provides a, a choice of three legislative routes uh, to exercise the powers of the of correction, the regulations made by UK ministers, regulations made by the devolved administrations, and uh, thirdly, uh, regulations made jointly by UK and devolved. And the, what challenges do you see arising from uh, having that choice of legislative routes? Yeah, the, so the the UK has the general plenary unlimited powers mm -hmm. and the simplest. You know, or, or the, the, the default will be when they use those powers in reserved areas. That's what we anticipate. But you're talking about when they use them in devolved areas. There, I mean, I think having those three routes is itself very complicated, uh, and it would depend on on whether there were attempts to use the first of those routes and, and, and why. So. If the UK were simply unilaterally to use delegated powers in devolved areas, there would be political <coughs> questions as to why that were the case. When, um, when if it's a devolved matter, there are there, there are provisions in the in the bill um, for joint delegated power making um, in in devolved areas. So similar to the Section 30 procedure that we see under the 1998 Act. Uh, the the so that's the first category. The third category that you're just kind of talking about. I mean, I think those are the two over which there would there will have to be a working out of when the UK does it alone and when the UK does it with the devolved administrations. I would imagine the default would be to try and do it cooperatively. That ought, you know, under the principles of the devolution settlement, that ought to be the case. The the middle one is an interesting one. Is this the sort of reference under clause ten to the powers that will re remain with the Scottish Parliament to make? Uh, delegated legislation in areas where they already have that power. You know, we don't really know. We've we've drilled down. You know, we've been asking about this, and uh, my understanding of of that is that the, the Scottish Parliament will acquire, or the Scottish government will acquire this power to continue to act in areas of EU law which are devolved at the moment, uh, and can use the delegated powers in the new act to 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 change. EU law that's firmly within devolved competence, um, insofar as to correct deficiencies and so on. So I think that's the least problematic. Again, round the borders, but the, the the more problematic would be the UK doing unilaterally st stuff in devolved areas, uh, and then you know how how that would marry up with the the shared mm -hmm. delegated power making. 
Uh, certainly, when I posed the question uh, to one of the earlier uh, uh, panels, um, I think the phrase, the phrase that they used was, uh, they will leave the, the joint scrutiny aside. Uh, they consider that to be a, a non-starter. Uh, so it's interesting to hear your uh, take on this. In practice, it might be the case. I mean, it, it could well be that the joint powers, because the, the bill anticipates that the joint powers will mostly be used for the transfer of powers. So, you know, to put it crudely, the, the bill envisages the UK transposing all of the EU law in devolved and reserved areas back almost into the, e the UK box. And then, by way of joint order making, gradually redevolving it, as it were. So I think that's probably what the, the you know, that's what the joint power is typically envisaged for. Okay. So yeah, it's probably the case that when it comes to simply the task of um, repatriating it, as it were, that will be done fairly unilaterally, one would, one would anticipate. Okay. And do you think it'd be possible for two legislatures to actually pass valid but conflicting legislation? Uh, an exercise of the powers in the bill? That's a very interesting question. I mean, this has always been a concern from, of mine from a practical point of view, that the, uh, the Scottish Parliament has competence in EU areas, uh, if, so far as they're devolved, um, that the bill guarantees that that continues. Um, Certainly, the bill attempts to get round that potential problem by removing competence in retained EU law, and it depends how broadly that is read. But I think that is a that is a potentially very broad provision that restricts the power of the devolved administrations to modify retained EU law. So that would seem to to prevent that risk stroke opportunity, depending on how one approaches it. Uh, but that would that would seem to be the, the purpose of the bill. And I imagine a court, for example, dealing with a, a competence dispute would probably read that in as the purpose of Clause 10, Clause 11. Mm. Okay. Um, also, the, there are limitations and restrictions on the, on the correcting powers uh, in Schedule 2, which apply to the devolved authorities, but not to the UK ministers. Uh, under their equivalent powers. Examples include uh, a more limited power to subdelegate uh, than is available to UK ministers and the requirement to obtain consent of UK ministers in certain circumstances. Uh, are these additional limitations on Scottish ministers appropriate? And what do you take uh, what, sorry, what do you take of the Scottish Government's proposed amendments to remove these restrictions? I think they're, they're not hugely significant, and I, I, and I think at a symbolic level, I mean, one understands that the, the approach the UK has taken here, I, I, I'm aware that this is a, a very delicate area, and, I, and I'm not defending the overall approach of this bill, but it is what it is, and they've decided to do it by whole-scale transposition. And then, having said that, there, there are ways in the bill which could be more sensitive to, to devolution. And I think the examples you've alluded to are examples where it doesn't seem to me that there would be a pressing need for those sorts of fairly minor limitations. Um, my sense is that, that this is probably unnecessary. I mean, an overall, an overall theme, which I think is far more important than the technicality of a lot of this, these provisions, is the absolute need for healthy intergovernmental relations. And I know I've talked about this before, and then people say, well, you know, it's a truism. And of course it's a truism, but, but it ought not to be forgotten. And the reason I say that is because maybe some of these more minor provisions, which raise the hackles of people who feel they're outside the spirit of devolved settlements, are not conducive to reaching intergovernmental agreement on the bigger issues that really matter. So I, I don't think those minor provisions are particularly necessary, and I think they perhaps show an excessive lack of trust in, in, in devolved administrations, which is not healthy. Well, IGR will come up okay. uh, in sure. later questioning. <laughs> um, certainly, also, an exercise of the, the powers uh, devolved authorities may not uh, modify retained direct EU legislation uh, or make uh, provisioning consistent with a modification of retained direct EU legislation made by uh, 
UK ministers uh, do you foresee any difficulties with these restrictions? I mean, that's the general gist of the bill, um, which is that we have this body of law, which is retained EU law, which is, you know, has within it many sub-elements. Um, and essentially, that's the law that, that is either EU law that, that directly affects us, which is still Brussels law, we bring, we're going to bring that in, or it's law that the UK has, has made into, U, EU law, into UK law from the EU. And all of that is going to be transferred into the, the status of retained EU law. And the approach of the bill is that the devolved administrations cannot amend that until that is sifted and what is devolved what ought to be devolved is then parceled out. There could have been another way to, 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 to approach this bill. There could have been other ways to approach this bill. This is one way to do it. And I don't actually see I can see it as a, a problem of principle from a devolved perspective. I, I get that. I think the invasion that it poses to devolution, because it's not, it's just not congruent with the, the principles we've had for devolution over the nearly two decades. I completely get that. But given that this is the approach that has been taken, that is correctable by what, or it's potentially correctable by the other commitment in the government's explanatory notes and, uh, to, to seek a rapid de devolution of the powers. Uh, if that is done fully and consistent with existing devolved powers, with a full commitment to, to really parceling out these powers in line with the nature of devolution settlements, then I think that problem of principle could partly be overcome. Uh, but it's, it is the way the bill stands, and really what's going to matter is how that, how those, that, how that position and how the powers related to that position play out in practice. That's what's really going to matter. Okay. Um, final question is that there is no equivalent for devolved authorities uh, of the power in Clause 17 to make consequential or transitional provision. Uh, would it be usual for a UK bill making provision within the Scottish Parliament's legislative competence to confer such a power on the Scottish ministers? It, it, it might well be. One of the... One of the difficulties with this bill, in terms of the delegated powers themselves, is that there's power layered on power layered on power. By the time you get to the consequential provision, you're almost wondering why it's there. The other powers are so extensive. You wonder, well, what, what on earth can be left here that you've not already provided a power to do? Um, so it seems to be a final catch-all power. My view... I think, looking at the nature of Clause 10 uh, and its relation to Schedule 2, is that the power of the devolved authorities to do anything in relation to retained EU law that they can currently do to things that are within devolved competence should be read, should be read as, a, as an all-encompassing power that would include transitional and consequential provisions. That would be my take on the exception that's built into Clause 10. And that might be something to seek clarification of, to, to seek clarification of the bill team or of the, in the UK Parliament, uh, that it is the case that, insofar as the Scottish Parliament still has powers in relation to retained EU law, those powers also em encompass consequential and transitional provisions, because there's no reason or principle why they ought not to, as, as far as I can see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alison Harris. Thank you. Good afternoon, Professor Tierney. The Bill does not provide any mechanism for Scottish Parliament's scrutiny of regulations made by UK ministers alone, irrespective of whether the regulations are a matter of significance for Scotland or if would have attracted the benefit of the sole convention had the matter been included in primary legislation. Does this present a gap in the Parliament's ability to scrutinise exercise of the bills in this power? Yeah, I, I think scrutiny is a, is a really crucial issue here. I mean, it's, I, you know, I talked about 
the general problem of principle, which Mr. McMillan was alluding to, that you know this is block, move to the UK, and then redistribute. Uh, and I've talked about how that can be corrected in a devolution-sensitive way. But one of the really crucial areas of that will be how closely scrutinised those powers are, particularly when, you, as you say, regulations are being made exclusively at UK level in areas that are going to affect devolved matters. Uh, and I, I think that's something for this part. I know this parliament and this mm -hmm. committee is thinking carefully about how scrutiny moves forward, but it's, it's a real potential lacuna. OK. So would you have any thoughts on how we could fill that gap? I mean, obviously, if these regulations are being tabled, one of the big problems is that so much of this is going to be done by negative procedure. So the kind of position you're talking about is constitutionally problematic because it's going to affect this parliament, but it's, got, but it's being done at, at Westminster. But the practical problem is it's going to be done very quickly and it's going to be laid before Westminster and passed you know, in a 21 day period unless there's the capacity in the parliament to, 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 to look at it, look at it quickly. Uh, we simply don't know what volume we're going to be talking about here, but it seems to me we're, we're, talking, we're, we're likely going to be looking at a massive volume. Uh, now, there's the issue of principle, which is itself problematic. Would it be a practical problem, in, in, just in terms of practice, were the UK Parliament to do this, just thinking about it, if they were to, to use these powers, even in a devolved area, to, to uh, modify retained EU law, presumably to, to bring matters into the purview of this retained EU law. That would all still, even after those powers have been used, that would all still be part of this vast body of law which would be subject to the discussions about subsequent devolution of those powers, of those areas of, of jurisdiction. So, so that the problem of principle is a significant one, uh, but it wouldn't be the end of the story. In terms of what this parliament could do, I mean, I, 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 I think uh, you need to be thinking about the extent to which you have the resources to be looking at legislation, draft legislation in another chamber. I think it'd be entirely constitutionally appropriate for this House to be looking at that legislation, even if it can't directly influence it. But the, another option is, and I don't know how far this can go, but it, clearly interparliamentary cooperation seems to me to be a, a very important theme going forward. OK, thank you. Is there a role for formal Scottish Parliament consultation or consent to the exercise of powers by UK ministers? And if so, should that role concern the exercise of powers relating to matters within the Parliament's legislative competence or matters which would be within legislative competence, notwithstanding the requirement of compatibility with the EU law? Or should it be something wider, such as the exercise of powers in areas of interest and importance to Scotland? How, how would you define that? Now, you've rightly said, uh, Ms Harris, that Sewell it doesn't apply to delegated legislation and that is a, we know we're now seeing just how big a deficit that is in terms of interparliamentary relations um, it's not inconceivable that new conventions should develop uh, that's how conventions emerge conventions don't well sometimes they're invented by politicians but you know Sewell to some extent was an invention which then but but it's not inconceivable that if the government, if the UK government is serious when it talks, and it talks a lot in the explanatory notes and in the delegated powers memorandum about the need for consent, about its commitment to consent, without mentioning Sewell in, in relation to delegated powers, it's not inconceivable that a practice, and certainly the devolved administrations can press, I would, would absolutely on the basis of constitutional principle, for practices to develop, and practices can become conventions, uh, whereby exactly those kind of avenues that you're talking about. Uh, so, right, we don't have the right to veto this delegated legislation. We don't have the right to, you know, we, if we passed a, a motion here, it 
it wouldn't fit within the Seoul Convention. We, we get all that. But let's talk about other conventions emerging here. If we're, if we're seriously moving forward with Brexit, we're looking for a common approach across the UK. We're trying to build common frameworks. We're trying to do this by consent. Then let's think about avenues through which a semi-formal form of consent should be required by this chamber and the other chambers for delegated for the use of delegated powers that are four square in devolved areas. So I, I, I think it's a perfectly legitimate constitutional move to, to try to make. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Alison. Uh, Colin. Thank you, convener. Um, returning a bit more to scrutiny, um, do you think that the bill has an appropriate split between matters that require the affirmative procedure and matters that, in respect to which there's a choice between the affirmative and negative procedures? No. <laughs> Bluntly, no. I mean, I, I think the... I was very surprised. I, I, the, the convener asked if I'd changed my mind on the bill. I think I was, I was maybe... I think you get worn down after a while. But I was... I, I, I'm still... I still find it constitutionally problematic. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And one of the, the areas that is really problematic is... The, the very limited range of matters for which affirmative procedure is expressly required. Given the, the vast swathes of, of areas that are going to be, uh, that are <clears throat> the vast swathes of policy areas involved, uh, one would have expected to see, I think, a far broader use of affirmative procedure. Once again, you know, to, to so you, the other argument is simply the, the practical one, that when you're talking about these many, many thousands of regulations and directives, to lay before Parliament for active affirmative consideration, each of these, you know, it does beg that it's, it, 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 it's very hard to see where the parliamentary time could come from. So. I know that sounds a bit ambiguous. I mean, I, I don't think it's appropriate. But on the other hand, I don't see how else you can do it. <laughs> the problem comes back to the project, not to the bill, in a sense. Do you think that uh, there's wide discretion given regarding the choice of negative and affirm affirmative procedure? And is that discretion appropriate? And how can ministers be held to account in respect of a choice? There is, there is, there is a, a very open approach, given that so, so little is reserved to... You definitely use, must use affirmative, then it's open to ministers. My sense is if you give ministers a choice to use negative, they're going to use negative. So the other th one you have to build in here is there's a third scrutiny procedure here, the made affirmative procedure, which is effectively no scrutiny procedure, which the minister can activate... In, an, in a case of urgency. So this is, a, this is an innovation in the bill. It's an opportunity for ministers to make delegated legislation in, a, in pressing circumstances, uh, which would become law without parliamentary scrutiny of any kind. Now, safeguards are built into that. It would require to be reassessed within a month and so on. But that in itself is, is left entirely to, as I can see it, entirely to the discretion of a minister to determine if the circumstances are sufficiently urgent to, to, to require that. So, yeah, the, this bill vests enormous trust in ministers and enormous trust in the robustness of the UK Parliament in particular, but other parliaments, to really follow very, very closely what they're going to do with this stuff. You've partially answered the question I'm going to ask already, but let me ask it anyway. Is there a role for strength and scrutiny, for example, to enable Parliament to be consulted on regulations laid in draft prior to final regulations being laid? And if so, which areas should be prioritised? This, to some extent, this <coughs> depends upon what these powers are going to be used for. The, the government has committed, as far as I read it, to not using these powers to make significant policy changes. The idea is that this is just to correct deficiencies, to make legislation uh, fit for purpose in the act of bringing it into UK law. 
various parliamentary committees here and, and <laughs> at Westminster, before the bill was even laid, put forward various recommendations for heightened scrutiny procedures of the kind you're talking about. Uh, or provisions analogous to clause to Schedule Seven of the Scotland Act 1998, which has the whole list of the different types of delegated power-making procedures that would involve the joint agreement of of this this House and and, and, and the UK Parliament. Uh, there were various innovations that that were that were put forward uh, recommending this. The government's response simply is that, uh, you know, for example, the, the, the provisions in the Legislative and Regulated Reform Act 2006, which set out extensive or, or super affirmative procedures. The government's response to this is simply that we still have the time, as far as I can, as far as I can read it, that we, we just have to get this done and this would take too long and it's just not feasible. If it were to be done, uh, I think a stronger suit to play would be to hold the government to the promise that big policy is not going to be done with these powers and to hold to the line that if you're going to make big policy, you need primary legislation. So this is, I mean, this is not going to be the only bill. The withdrawal bill is the first of bill. There's, there will be other bills in each, one assumes, that's what my understanding, in a, a number of discrete areas of EU competence law. And I think time might be better spent targeting primary legislation on big matters of policy when A, full Westminster scrutiny will apply and B, when so would apply, as far as this chamber is concerned. You touched briefly on the super affirmative process. Is that specifically allowed under this bill? It's not provided for. I mean, the funny thing about Parliament, I mean, I, I always find it slightly odd that government is putting forward a bill telling parliament how to scrutinise legislation. <laughs> I mean, it's always been my view that parliament should, you know, might well say to the parliamentary drafts, well, thank you very much. You know, it's good of you to tell us how, to, how we're going to do our job. But in fact, this is how we're going to scrutinise this. So to be honest, it's for people here, liaising with people at your, with your parliamentary equivalents at Westminster and say, these are the kinds of procedures we want to see in, the, in here. Uh, the, of course, the government, if it's drafting a bill, is is going to minimise the extent to which that bill is going to be scrutinised. But uh, if if there's a feasible argument that super affirmative should apply in relation to say matters that Miss Harris was talking about that hit on devolved areas, uh, then that argument should be should be made through one parliament talking to another and saying this is these are the kind of amendments we want to see in here. Um, what areas or, or categories of changes to EU law should this Parliament seek to prioritise in its scrutiny? We, well, I mean, obviously areas affect affecting devolved matters. Is that, or is that just a given? Is that what you mean? But I mean, to me, it would just clearly areas of devolved competence. <coughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So the, the 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 crucial stuff that we all know about environment, agriculture, fisheries. Yeah. So. Uh, it would seem to me that would be very important. But, you know, having said that, um, you know, it's a trite point and an obvious one that I'm making, but uh, if we are now talking about a UK that's going to be outside of the EU, just as the devolved legislation is coming into force, you know, the Scotland Act's new 2016, the Wales Act 2017, you know, we're in the middle of a lot of different changes. We hadn't really worked out the boundaries of devolved uh, reserved competence coming out of the 2016 Act. You know, if you look at, there's so many areas in the Scotland Act 2016 of shared, of shared powers between Scotland and the UK in all kinds of areas, from welfare to transport police to, to other areas of transport. And what I'm getting at now is that there are many areas that are, res that are reserve matters that are going to be impacting on Scotland in ways they may not have done like five years ago so directly. So so I think this parliament ought not to just be focusing on very traditional areas of devolved competence, but maybe thinking, well, wait a minute, that's yeah, that's a reserve matter and it's gone back to Westminster. 
But the UK could be using that power in a way that affects, say, welfare or transport or taxation or you know things that are now at the margins of devolved reserve competence. So it's got to be there are going to be new areas to, to look to in light of the Scotland Act 2016 that's maybe not been fully thought through yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do any members have any other questions? No? Um, well, Professor Tini, thank you for your time. It's uh, probably felt like a whistle-stop tour, uh, but I think uh, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, so thank you once again. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, with that, I shall close the meeting. <laughs>